For just a moment, close your eyes and imagine this. Imagine crystal clear turquoise waters glistening in the afternoon sun, lapping against the velvety white beach. Imagine a sky of pelicans and frigate birds swooping and gliding above a submerged world. Underwater forests of living coral, dazzling schools of fish and great sea turtles swimming and breathing in a quiet liquid realm. Imagine a land steeped in a rich cultural legacy from swashbuckling pirates to Danish sugar plantations to a mysterious early peoples of earth and spirit. Imagine a culture where this vibrant island way of life still thrives, carrying on traditions hundreds of years old. Now open your eyes. This place, this paradise, is the Virgin Islands National Park, where visitors from around the world take refuge from the demands of the 21st century. Spread across two-thirds of St. John, a tiny island jewel in the Caribbean Sea, the National Park is today a reality, a stunning oasis where spectacular waters, beautiful coral reefs, magnificent beaches, historic ruins and hiking trails provide endless hours of exploration and enjoyment, as well as inspiration, solitude, and reflection. Yet it's almost impossible not to wonder how in today's fast-paced world, where nature so often becomes the victim of commerce, did the Virgin Islands National Park come to be forever shielded from exploitation? The often quoted and somewhat misleading answer is that a wealthy philanthropist secretly purchased numerous tracts of land and then turned it over to Congress to sign into a national park. But the deeper answers to that question take us into a fascinating story of a West Indian community and its legendary leader and of the two very different men who had one very similar vision. To protect and preserve the unparalleled beauty of St. John for generations to come. It is the year 1936. Jesse Owens stuns Hitler's Germany at the games of the 11th Olympiad. The guns of the Spanish Civil War foreshadow the Great War to come. Across the globe in America, after a landslide election, Franklin D. Roosevelt has just been elected to his second term as president, and FDR's most popular New Deal program, the Civilian Conservation Corps, has just opened its first camp in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Headed by Harold Hubler, or Hal by those who know him, the CCC's work there is hailed as a success. In 1938, Hal opened the first CCC camp in St. John at Calabash Boom. On this small island, seemingly forgotten by time, the Corps labored under primitive conditions, where roads resembled dry stream beds and brambles were sometimes cleared with flamethrowers. But in every direction, they were surrounded by tropical paradise. The following year, Hal received a special request from Conrad Wirth, the assistant director to the branch of lands for the National Park Service. At the time, the still struggling U.S. Virgin Islands were hemorrhaging money from the states, and in a bid to jumpstart the territory's economy to fiscal independence, VI Governor Paul Pearson had embraced the idea that St. John be considered as a park of some type. Throughout the 1930s, the territorial government and federal officials considered a number of options. Worth's directive to Hal was for an evaluation of just such possibilities. But even as Hal dutifully set about completing Worth's request, at the time such a plan would have seemed painfully unlikely. Though the Great Depression was slowly releasing its ghastly grip on America, by 1939, turmoil in Europe forced the country to turn its attention abroad. Then not long after Hal completed his report, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and America's entry into World War II scuttled all efforts towards a national park on St. John. Yet one could also argue that the right leaders for such an endeavor were otherwise occupied, or were perhaps occupied elsewhere.
If you were to stroll through the harbor town of Cruz Bay today, you would notice the name Julius Sproul painted boldly across the island's largest school in honor of a true St. Jonian who left a prolific legacy of community service. In 1936, while the Civilian Conservation Corps was first getting underway, Julius Sproul Sr. was elected councilman to the Municipal Council of the Virgin Islands. In the early 1940s, he authored groundbreaking legislation that extended affordable housing to many locals on St. John. Sproul also strove to make money available to all, helping to attract the first bank to Cruz Bay, and he became a champion of improving transportation on the island. In 1954, he was elected St. John's first senator. It was this dedication to the community and his distinguished record of advocating on behalf of all St. Jonians that would later enable him to generate support, both local and national, for a tremendous proposal, the Virgin Islands National Park, that would change St. John forever. As Sproul was at work improving St. John, another great leader and key figure to the story was quickly establishing himself as a pioneer in the venture capital field, Lawrence Rockefeller, whose name is synonymous today with the three C's, capitalism, conservation, and cancer research. Lawrence, or LSR as he was called, was the grandson of billionaire John D. Rockefeller, founder of Standard Oil, and son of John D. Rockefeller, Jr., who held these words sacred. I believe that every right implies a responsibility, every opportunity an obligation, every possession a duty. Lawrence's life would become a testament to his father's words. Amidst the labyrinth of his legacies stands the Grand Teton National Park, one of many national parks that exists thanks to the Rockefellers and Lawrence's vision, foresight, and generosity. Besides his conservation efforts, Lawrence also served as chairman of the Memorial Sloan Kittering Cancer Center. He also pioneered in the risky venture capital field, facilitating the creation of such cutting-edge startups as Eastern Airlines, McDonald Aircraft, and the iTech Corporation. But in counterpart to his high-powered profession, LSR was also a deeply spiritual man, and in 1949, he set out with his wife Mary to explore the Caribbean aboard their 65-foot cabin cruiser, the Dauntless. Their search was for an ideal, naturalistic setting to create LSR's vision for a soul-restoring retreat. At the age of 42, after three years of crisscrossing the Caribbean, Rockefeller dropped anchor at Trunk Bay and discovered St. John to be the most beautiful island he'd ever seen. When he visited Keneal Bay, home to a small resort built among the ruins of a colonial sugar plantation, LSR knew instantly that this was it. Also in 1952, by a strange stroke of coincidence, or perhaps by fate, another stateside gentleman named Frank Stick found his way to St. John. He had come to illustrate a long-dreamed book featuring fish of the Atlantic. In the process, he too considered a business venture, in his case, Lambshire Estate on the island's south shore. Unlike LSR, Frank Stick was not wealthy, but by the age of 68, this driven hunter, fisherman, artist, and conservationist had learned to leverage his money and his connections. Born in 1884 in the Dakota Territory, as a young man, Stick studied under the famous watercolorist Howard Pyle, and by the early 1900s, he was a heavily published illustrator, appearing in such prestigious magazines as the Saturday Evening Post. However, Stick eventually became disillusioned with the art world, and in the 1920s, he moved to the pristine outer banks of North Carolina, beginning what would be a lifelong pursuit to preserve America's natural heritage. In 1927, 
Stick arranged for an acquisition of the land by the National Park Service for the Wright Brothers Memorial Monument. A few years later, Stick attracted the Civilian Conservation Corps to the Outer Banks to stabilize the dunes and provide jobs for young men. Then in 1933, Stick formally proposed and devoted himself to a 20-year effort to establish the Cape Hatteras National Seashore Park. And so, among the North Shore ruins of this idyllic paradise, far distant from the grasping reach of the modern world, within six months, Rockefeller had acquired the Keneal Bay Plantation and began its transformation into his life-dreamed resort. In the process, LSR also gave a dramatic boost to the island's economy, employing many native St. Jonians who might otherwise have had to leave the island for work, a fact that did not go unnoticed by St. John Senator Julius Sproul. At the same time, on the south side of the island, Frank Stick was likewise busy along with four close friends from North Carolina. He purchased the Lambshire estate, once home to a Danish countess, known to dramatically ride her white stallion down to its beach below. Capitalizing on his investment, Stick developed a business prospectus for Lambshire's commercial and residential development, as well as that of the adjacent Reef Bay. Stick even brought in his son David to manage the project. However, David's pregnant wife's first introduction to St. John was via an accidental poisoning by a mansion eel tree. She soon wished for David to have no part of this lonely and remote venture, and the young couple returned to the States. As Frank Stick and his wife Maud set off to explore the island on frequent jeep forays from their Lampshire estate, they became utterly captivated by its rugged and pristine beauty and its friendly inhabitants. And Stick began to worry about St. John's future. As a real estate developer, he could see only two possibilities as the unrelenting engines of progress churned their way across the waters. One, as an island of private estates walled by countless no trespassing signs, or two, as a glaring tourist mecca with resorts erupting behind every beach. But then, Stick came across Hal Hubler's original 1939 proposal to establish St. John as a national park. As he read, Frank saw another bold possibility. He immediately abandoned his plans to commercialize the South Shore properties and began a new tack. On May 30th, 1954, in an extensive 14-page letter along with Hal's original report, Frank Stick proposed the idea of a national park for St. John to Archie Alexander, then governor of the Virgin Islands. On June 1st, though the two were still yet to meet, Frank Stick wrote another letter to Lawrence Rockefeller. Knowing of your great interest in the proper development of the island of St. John, I enclose a copy of a letter to Governor Alexander, which presents some possibly radical ideas relative to the progression of St. John. From information which has come to me through mutual friends, I believe our ideas meet on at least two issues. These are the preservation of this magnificent example of God's handiwork, St. John, and its people from both exploitation and despoilation. In a little over a week, Lawrence responded to Frank's letter. The timing was perfect, as not only was LSR then flush with his family's Grand Teton National Park success, Rockefeller too was searching for ways to help St. Jonians on his newly adopted island. Dear Mr. Stick, thank you for your nice letter of June 1. I have read this material with interest and share much of the philosophy relative to the development of St. John. I found the Park Service report quite fascinating not only on account of the historical background, but also because of the far-seeing and imaginative approach of the author. At Rockefeller Plaza in New York, the two men finally meet, along with LSR's associate, Alsted Boyer. Immediately, they found themselves motivated by an identical desire for St. John's future, 
and Stick's head was literally sent spinning at the historic possibilities ahead of them. Soon after, Conrad Wirth, who first requested St. John be surveyed as a possible national park in the 30s, and who now served as the director of the National Park Service, re-entered the picture after receiving a letter from Stick outlining his and Rockefeller's intentions. That September, the Triangle of Men, LSR, Frank, and Worth began a series of meetings in both New York and in Washington, D.C. to discuss the project. Each of the three men felt that it was absolutely vital to preserve and protect St. John's unique beauty from the ravages of commercialism. And each of them felt the best route to accomplish this was through the creation of a national park. To achieve this goal, they broke down the vital work necessary to best suit their individual strengths. Lawrence S. Rockefeller would fund, oversee, and direct the project with the help of his associate, Alston Boyer. Worth would use his political experience to shepherd the necessary legislation through Congress, and Stick would capitalize on his real estate savvy and island contacts to line up the options and purchase agreements on the land. He would also team up with Hal Hubler to update Hal's original 1939 report. The work was not to be easy, even though the original land holdings for the park came from only 14 owners and many of those landowners were from off-island. The land for those actually living on St. John was especially precious. From his years living at Lambshire Bay, Stick realized this and felt a tremendous responsibility in meeting the challenges of acquiring those lands in a way that would best benefit local St. Jonians, as well as their children in the future. It is a testament to his efforts and the growing respect for the name Lawrence Rockefeller that both Senator Julius Sproul as well as his cousin Gerhard Sproul were among the original 14 offering their lands for the park. Two months later, at a meeting at Keneal Bay, as LSR and Boyer worry about the Rockefeller name driving up land prices, Stick dropped by and casually mentioned that he already had the purchased options on 5,000 acres of land, the minimum needed. He had quietly used his own money to acquire them. Stick then turned these options over to the Jackson Hole Preserve Incorporated, the Rockefeller nonprofit organization for conservation, to purchase and then hold the properties in trust until Congress authorized the park. By early 1956, much that had before seemed impossible was now accomplished. All that was left were two key pieces of legislation, one in the Virgin Islands Legislature and one in the U.S. Congress. Enter the distinguished senator from St. John, Julius Sproul. In a special session, Senator Sproul introduced and sponsored Bill No. 165, Resolution 17A, proposal to establish a national park on the island of St. John, VI. It passed in the legislature and the bill was signed into law by VI Governor Walter Gordon. But when the federal bill traveled to the U.S. Congress, opposition for the future park surfaced from the six Republican members of the Interior Committee, claiming, among other things, that it would stifle private enterprise on St. John. They also felt it would be too expensive both to create and visit and thus be a drain on the national park system. In an elegantly worded letter to the Virgin Islands Daily News, Senator Sproul effectively demolished their arguments by pointing out factual errors as well as the curious fact that four of the six Republicans represented districts that already contained national parks and that just perhaps they were worried that such a park situated in a year-round paradise might draw patronage from their own. In his letter, Julius Sproul also made another interesting note. In an era where black and white people were not even allowed to drink from the same water fountain in parts of America, Sproul wrote that the Virgin Islands National Park would be the first and only national park in the United States that would have a population of primarily African descent, the only spot in our hemisphere where our people might benefit from a federal project, which I believe every native of St. John believes to be for our great future good and economic improvement, and who are following this bill with deep convictions of right and wrong. It was not until four months later, on August 2nd, 1956, 
after Sproul's letter and perhaps just a bit of the legendary Rockefeller influence, that Congress passed the enabling legislation. The legislation required that a minimum of 5,000 acres be donated to the United States government and that the acreage within the boundaries of the park be limited to 9,485 acres, thus leaving approximately 3,000 acres outside national park boundaries for the people of St. John. On August 2, 1956, President Dwight Eisenhower signed the bill into law, a historic act that finally fulfilled LSR and Stick's wish to benefit both the nation as well as St. John's current inhabitants. The fruition of the Virgin Islands National Park, after 20 years of dreams and struggles and hard work, finally came to its realization on December 1, 1956. Hosted by Lawrence S. Rockefeller and his wife Mary, 920 guests attended the picnic at Cruz Bay Park. It was the largest crowd in St. John's history, with reporters flying in from as far away as New York, Texas, California, and even Canada. In the soft tropical air, children played as adults swayed to Calypso music, their rum drinks in hand, waiting in line for an immense feast prepared by Andromeda Keating and the Keneal Bay Plantation. Then beneath a perfect sky, a marching band led the crowd to what is now the ball field of the Julia Sproul School for the dedication ceremony. From the bandstand, speeches were made, people cheered, and Lawrence S. Rockefeller turned over the property deeds to Fred Seaton, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, giving this land back to all for all of perpetuity. On December 27, Conrad Wirth wrote of the park's success and LSR's great accomplishments in a letter to Lawrence's father, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. One of the most heartwarming experiences I have ever witnessed occurred when Lawrence got up to present the deeds to the secretary, when many of the local people got up and clapped and shouted, God bless Mr. Rockefeller. It expresses a deep feeling of appreciation which cannot be expressed better in any other way. Indeed, the sentiment expressed in this letter was felt genuinely by most St. Jonians at the time. Senator Julius Sproul earlier that year had captured this feeling in an open letter in the St. Thomas Daily News. While the name Lawrence Rockefeller is mentioned in connection with the proposed national park, his part and proposed future benefactions have been too lightly dwelt upon. No man knows better than the writer what Mr. Rockefeller's efforts so far have meant to the people of St. John. I can state with complete conviction that during the past year and more, as the sole result of this generous and far-seeing man's efforts, our people have enjoyed greater prosperity than at any time in the memory of our oldest inhabitants. And without these efforts, many of our people would have been forced to seek precarious employment in distant lands, as has been the unhappy rule in years gone by. Yet as with the stories of many national parks, controversies surrounding the park's creation and administration appeared in the years immediately after its founding. Specifically, these dealt with a proposed model village for Cruise Bay and the higher land prices paid later by the park to those who had initially held out their properties. Conflicts over the use of park lands and waters for grazing and collecting, as well as the employment and advancement of native St. Jonians within the park were also key concerns. From today's perspective, it's clear that each of the controversial issues could have been resolved by means less divisive. However, despite these problems, the park was a turning point for the Virgin Islands, and it has been crucial in the preservation of St. John's history, culture, and natural resources. In a letter dated May 23, 1958, LSR formally acknowledged the contributions of Frank Stick, including his gift of approximately $50,000 to Jackson Hole Preserve Incorporated, 
which represented Stick's share of the Lampshire land. In it he wrote, You have undertaken this work as a volunteer, and you have consistently resisted our efforts to reimburse you for the enormous amount of time and effort you have put into this project. Since that day, many years ago, when you brought the Hubler Report to my attention and offered your lands, we have seen the project become a reality. I am sure that this achievement will be a lasting satisfaction to you. The Virgin Islands National Park will in the years to come mean more and more to people there and those who come to the Virgin Islands from all parts of the globe in keeping with the hopes and expectations expressed at its inception. In the years to come, Rockefeller's words would prove to be prophetic. Every year, over a million visitors arrive on the tiny island of St. John to find solace and inspiration in this natural haven of beauty. With gratitude and respect, we honor the vision and foresight of those who worked for a park for St. John, for those who gave up their lands in good faith, and for the desire of Frank Stick to preserve this magnificent example of God's handiwork and its people from both exploitation and despoilation. In 1991, Lawrence was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by then President George Bush in recognition of his lifelong efforts in conservation. Two decades after the founding of the park, Lawrence S. Rockefeller would give his views on creative fulfillment, thoughts that apply well to the establishment of the Virgin Islands National Park. Every living thing seeks to fulfill itself according to its own potential. Creative fulfillment is a basic need of all people. With my brothers and myself, there was a difference in scale, but the problems we faced in seeking self-fulfillment were not so different from those encountered by every man. If you think of the artist in every man seeking creative fulfillment and his life given to him as a canvas, then you can see that we were given more materials and a larger canvas to work with than other men, and more was expected of us. But the search for creative fulfillment was not so different from that of other men. How we painted on our canvas and what the final pictures came to be is for others to judge. We thanked him for the interest he had in the Virgin Islands because he had the wealth and the knowledge and the method of doing things we could see he would be a good for us all. Personally, I think the National Park has been good for all the Virgin Islands. And the way they have been going, which we didn't see, at that time, and still sometimes don't see, is for the betterment of the Virgin Islands. There was a, a great deal of uh, expectation on the part of the people on St. John about the development of the park. The, the people that were on St. John were there because they truly loved it, and I, I do believe that they, they felt sincerely that the park would preserve and, and protect it somehow freeze it in time uh, for the future. Believe me, from my own perspective, I am very thankful for the National Park on St. John. I, I can't imagine what St. John would look like today if it were not for the park. I think I'll be probably eternally grateful to Lawrence Rockefeller and, and, and all the individuals that were involved in creating the National Park in St. John. If it weren't for the National Park on St. John, I, I, I know, bottom of my heart, that St. John would look just like St. Thomas, or worse. I think that every beach would probably have a resort development on it of some sort, either hotel, condominiums. Uh, St. John would not be for St. Johnians anymore. North Shore, I think, is my most beautiful part because I'm uh, driving along 
we stop very often and look over the area of Leicester Bay. Of course, looking down on Peniel and then coming over to Trunk and looking down, it, it is just breathtaking. It's also relaxing and it puts you, it, it sort of take, uh, cleanse your soul in a sense. My father really loved St. John, the natural island, the, the physical island, and the, the St. Johnian people. If he were to be alive today, I don't think he'd want to look at Cruise Bay, but I could picture him quite happily taking a, uh, <laughs> taking a drive out North Shore Road and uh, not, no, there wouldn't be too many shocks <laughs> to the system along the way. Today, the park receives over a million visitors per year. So we know that those who question uh, the worth and the value of the park didn't have a real vision to where the park uh, and its travel are where it is today in terms of its worth and value uh, to the visiting public. I wish that many persons could feel, well, could share the joy that I share in growing up on St. John. As a, growing up in St. John to me has been a wonderful, beautiful experience. And I hope that people, many persons this generation and the generations to come will be able to be sharing part of that joy and realize that as beautiful as the island is, part of that joy is loving and sharing.